Some of you know that my career here at Tardec began by my being hired by the next speaker. Why a man as smart as him would hire a former naval aviator to work for the Army is beyond me. I'll never forget that we initially agreed to a six month trial period. And I, for one, am extremely grateful that as smart as he was, he still kept me on. That was almost nine years ago when Dr. Paul Rogers was the Tardic Research Director. Even then, he had a bigger vision of what he believed Tardic could be for both the Army and the community. His next assignment was serving as a Deputy Program Executive Officer for the Ground Combat Systems. His responsibilities included communication and coordination for an or organization managing both pre-acquisition programs as well as multiple major existing acquisition programs for the Army's Paladin, Abrams, Bradley, and Stryker programs, and approximately 100 other weapons systems. In 2012, he was selected to return as the TARDIC director. You may have heard him speak at uh, GV sets that year. I certainly heard from many of our industry partners, some of you out there right now, how excited they were for his vision for a stronger TARDIC, which depended upon close coordination with those in the greater defense marketplace. In 2013, he initiated the creation of the initial TARDIC 30-year strategy, an effort that took significant resources and time. He then launched this long-term technology vision for TARDIC at GB Sets in August of that same year, asking all of you for your support. A few months later, in 2014, TARDIC held its first Industry Days event at our facility to provide you the necessary tools to understand exactly how you could play a part in that strategy and the Army's future. His dedication to technology advancement continues this year at this, our third Industry Days event. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you a true visionary, a soldier himself, the TARDIC director, and the smartest boss I've ever had, Dr. Paul <laughs> Rogers. Well, good morning. That last statement saved himself, so he's, he's very smart, but I do appreciate it. For you in the back of the room, I am standing up, so I apologize if you can't see me, but I'll try to move around here. I don't want to get up in front of the slides, although they are projecting on other screens, but I want to make sure that you can see the information that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I do believe in uh, three principles for a government agency. Uh, we have to be accessible, and that's one of the purposes of this forum. We also have to be transparent. That's the second purpose of this forum. So accessible and transparent. So the purpose of the industry days is for us to lay out our current plans, our projections for our investments, our needs, so that we can then purposefully engage with our industry partners, help them do their business development and planning, but then also help them understand where their actions can feed our 30-year strategy. Typically, strategies are very high-level framing documents. Ours is very different. It's very high level in framing, but it's hundreds of pages, and you can dig right down into tasks. The intent of our strategy is not only to convey our needs to industry, but I want every person working in TARDEC to understand how their daily contributions fit within that roadmap. We are trying to go from a place we are today to a future place. Our strategy helps us stay on that course. We revisit it, we are on 2.0, I think we call it internally. So we initially developed it, but we went through and scrubbed every aspect of it this past year to make sure it was still relevant and in line with where the Army was going into the future. So that is our way of staying relevant for the Army and to challenge our current investments and make sure they are purposely feeding an outcome. So this process is for us to refresh and update where we are within that strategy. If this is your first forum, some of that may seem a little bit foreign to you, but hopefully over the course of today and tomorrow, you'll become comfortable with it. And then as we move forward over the next few weeks and you have follow-up visits with people where you see opportunities, you can be a little bit more uh, understanding of where you fit into that process. So this is just the starting of a conversation for many of you. It's the continuation of a conversation for those who've been part of the industry forums in the past. 
and who have been part of the business for TARDA. So I, I invite you to dig into that, to challenge it, show us where we are wrong. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but I don't have sufficient time, even, sir, with the extra time. I don't have sufficient time to get into a lot of details, but that is why we have the breakout sessions. So you can have that one-on-one -on -one engagement, and you can better understand where we're going. So this is, again, very purposeful. Now, I think I told you the three attributes. So I talked about accessibility, transparency, but the third one is equally important for any organization, and I believe especially for a governmental organization. And that's responsiveness. We have to be responsive. And we take that very, very, uh, uh, that's very important to us. And we take it very seriously. So as you engage, I have an expectation for my leadership team to respond. As you challenge them, they have a responsibility to <laughs> counter challenge or explain. So again, today is the first engagement, but they have a responsibility over time to respond to that engagement. So, and I think um, some of you know that as I get word that somebody isn't quite responding, we have a conversation internal and that gets resolved. So hold us accountable. We are accountable to you. We cannot be successful if you're not successful. And I think we have a responsibility to help you be successful. And the communication, the insights, the vision that we're portraying is based on our understanding of where the Army's going. We have a unique role in that. And it's our responsibility to convey that to industry so that we can optimize your engagement back to the Army. So that's the purpose of this forum. Hold us accountable. The surveys that Steve talked about are very, very important. We have redesigned this event every year based on that feedback. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for your interest. And more importantly, thank you for the support you're giving us for our warfighter. Sir, thank you very much for, for being our host here and our keynote. Uh, for those, if any Macomb County residents or anybody who works in this county, you have great leadership and he's not running for office. And if there's any lawyers, I'm not endorsing on behalf of any. But he truly is personally engaged. He's not a leader that comes through, shows up in an event, and then disappears and you don't hear from him again. He and his team are engaged on a regular basis. He mentioned Vicki. I get, I think it's every two weeks, but I'll say weekly, emails from her and her team about MADCAT and some of the stuff they're doing in their cyber activities. So it's, it's a constant engagement. They're very serious about it. So as he's here today, please take an opportunity to engage him. And, uh, and talk to them. But I'm very grateful for the leadership and, and the partnership as we support our soldiers. Okay, so I've now used up, I think, that first 15 minutes that I got back. So I do want to jump into some of the, uh, the slides I have here. The first one I want to talk about is our strategy. And again, I can't possibly spend time to get down to each one of these value streams and their definition. However, the pamphlet you have in your, your folder gives you some greater definition. So if you're not familiar with it or if you're kind of familiar but you need to understand better, please take a look at that. As you engage different members of my team today and tomorrow, they align to some aspect, one of these value streams, based on where they fit in. If you're selling product that you want to get on a vehicle today, you are typically dealing with somebody in value stream two. <coughs> if you're looking to develop technologies over time, with of course the goal to transition onto a vehicle, but it takes more ma uh, maturation, more investment, that is our value stream one, that's shaping the future force. And then all of our products, our services, our people, our tools, our facilities, that underwrite value stream one and two are captured in this foundational value stream, and that's value stream three. So we use our strategy to recruit our next generation of talent. Based on our understanding of where the Army's going, we use that when we go to college campuses, and we look for people with certain skill sets that we know we're gonna need five years from now. That's how this all ties together. And we're investing in facilities that we know we're gonna need five years from now. It's too late to start that when you have the need. So this helps us look 
beyond the horizon so that we're anticipating needs and moving forward. That's kind of how it works. So as you're looking at tools, models, simulations, that falls down into Value Stream 3. And we are always looking for new capability that is required to support the future Army. So these are nested uh, lines of effort or value streams. So to understand that, I think, brings some greater clarity. And if you're looking, again, to sell a product and get it onto a vehicle today, you're probably dealing, most likely dealing with folks who spend their time in value stream too. Okay, so why do we think, uh, you know, a 30-year strategy, you think 30 years, you know, if we could predict that long, we wouldn't be working, right? We'd be buying stock and selling it on time. But uh, the 30-year strategy is the horizon in which we feel comfortable, we can at least understand and start to shape. And the reason we feel that is the proper horizon is based on our understanding of the strategic foundation of the Army and also the art of the possible. So the strategic foundation of the Army is critical for us. TRADOC, our Training and Doctrine Command, are the architects of the future Army. They write the requirements, but that requirement for a vehicle solution or a materiel solution is based on their understanding of the army they want to become. So we have the army today, and it's very successful, but the world is constantly evolving, constantly changing. So it's TRADOC's responsibility to be thinking. If you use the word futurist, which many do in industry, they're the ones that are trying to think and shape that future army. The work they are doing is critical if we want to stay ahead of the evolving global situation. So as they are studying the future, they are developing documents such as the Army Operating Concept, War Fighting Functional Concepts. They are coming up with strategies such as the Combat Vehicle Modernization Strategy. They're developing the Army's Robotic Strategy. And it's all shaped on the Army they want to become. So we have developed a, a group of folks, volunteers, and they were responsible for going through line by line and studying every document being published by TRADOC. As they thought they understood it, we would then invite the author of that document to come into TARDEC and debate the team that studied it. The goal there was to have a team of folks that understood that document as well as the author. And then that same team would understand all of these documents. And typically, an author of one didn't spend their time studying what every other author wrote. So I think this cohort of people probably understand the TRADOC documents and the definition of the future army as good, if not better, than anybody in TRADOC. And that was the goal. And we felt that was very necessary to understand how they were articulating the future of the army. That is our strategic foundation. Understand where the army wants to go. Then. The work in our core business is understanding where technologies can take us. And it's technologies all the way down to material science, to lubricants, water purification, engines, transmission, road wheels, any component that falls within a ground vehicle system. We have a fairly good, I think it's a very good, but we're looking for your challenge. I think we have a very good understanding of where technology will lead us over the next decade or two decades, possibly even three decades. We understand the physics and the development times for new technologies. Now we're always looking for that disruptive idea, that innovative solution that we nobody had anticipated. And that's why this engagement is so important. I want you to prove us wrong. I want you to challenge us. Because all we're going to do is take that information back into our strategy and adjust our strategy and our timeline and the outcomes that come of it. So our, our 30-year strategy is based on these two aspects, understanding where the future of the Army is, as well as they can articulate it, and understanding the art of the possible based on technologies, and then the integrated solutions that come from those technologies. With those two aspects, we can show the Army over the next several decades what type of material solutions are possible. That information then goes back into what they think they want out of the Army. So it helps them understand what they can truly achieve. Okay, So that's the construct within the strategy. And then as I said earlier on, you can take any one of these lines of effort and 
it's expected to decompose it right down so that GS12, GS13 engineer working at Tardex sees how their daily contribution fits within our strategy and our roadmap to get to where we want to get to. So it's very, very deliberate, very purposeful. The purpose of today is to continue to update where we are with this and then tomorrow's breakouts is to get into greater detail that aligns with your interests or your competencies. Okay. Let me jump to the next slide. Uh, the, uh, our engagement, uh, many see us in this community working with our program executive officers, working for the PMs in the development, sustainment, fielding of combat platforms. And it includes Army watercraft, sets kit outfit. It's a very wide uh, portfolio that's managed out of Macomb <laughs> County here. But we have an equal role to support the future of the Army, the TRADA entity. So if you look at our business model, we have our value stream one, which is focused on helping TRADOC understand what's possible over time, and then develop the requirements that define that capability that now the acquisition community is responsible for developing and fielding with industry. So we have a responsibility there that's germane to TARDEC. We also have a responsibility to support those PMs and PEOs in the development of those capabilities and the fielding and sustainment of those capabilities. So I have almost 350, I think is the number now, engineers that are TARDIC engineers, but they work and wear the hat of the program office that they support. So if you talk to an engineer in PM Abrams, they're probably a TARDEC engineer. They will never own up to it. They'll never admit it. <laughs> could be for historical reasons, or it could be because they are a team member, and they are responsible for that leadership. That leadership team rates them every year. So it's that type of responsibility. So we have a significant part of our workforce that's over on that side. And then we have the rest of TARDAC that is responsible for the engineering services and support and technology transition for those programs. So that the Abrams, the Bradleys, the Strikers, the FMTVs, the you know, future JLTV, they stay relevant over time. And there's technology developments that feed into those vehicle programs over time. So uh, just for awareness, we serve many functions and many masters. Again, significant part of our effort is looking at the future of the Army. And in sometimes it's in a challenge or, or contrast to the, the current vehicle programs. And then the other side of our organization is supporting those programs and maintaining their relevancy. And then of course our value stream three are all the tools and talents and uh, resources necessary to underwrite those top two value streams. Okay, public-private partnerships. This has been emphasized over the last year, year and a half. And this is a business model that we are really working with a lot with our industry <coughs> partners. And it's a work in progress. Anybody who's been around this business for a long time uh, have lived through the government industry days, where the government's on one side and we're just trying to find a reason to catch the industry not doing what they're contracted to do. And it was very much a oversight role. That still exists. But at our level and within TARDEC, we see a significant responsibility in developing a better partnership. And we're really going after this public-private partnership aggressively. There's a couple purposes. One is that it brings greater clarity not only to industry of the Army needs, but it brings greater clarity to the Army of what industry can offer down at the technology level. So I think that's important for both parties. Secondly, we've all heard about the the uh, valley of death when it comes to technology transition. We have great capabilities in industry, we have great capabilities in government labs that have been developed and matured, but trying to get those systems across and integrate into a vehicle system, that could be a career in of itself. And we've left a lot of great capability on the shelf because we've failed to successfully transition it to a program of record. I think this public-private partnership is a means to bridge that valley of death. The greater involvement we have and the better understanding of one another, I think it increases the opportunity to transition that technology. And I'm willing to fail by trying. It's a shift in the paradigm 
but I think it's very necessary. We have decades of showing how not to do it. So you're gonna have a much tougher time convincing me to stay, stay with the existing paradigm than try something that might have some risks associated with it. We are all in with this. And there's great examples. MAPS, which is our modular active protection system. We have developed for, again, 30 or 40 years active protection solution. We have had in the United States some of the most successful active protection solutions. And these are the, the uh, protection mechanisms that shoot down and defeat incoming threats in the air. For those who may not be as uh, versed in active, the term active protection. So you're, you're essentially sending out a rocket to knock down something, a projectile coming at the vehicle system. We have had incredibly mature solutions. They have failed to transition to a program of record and have ended up being canceled. Only to have other countries around the world field something on their own. So we have to get after this. There are many reasons why we have failed to transition. We have designed the modular active protection system to get after some of those reasons for failure. This is the development of an architecture and common controller that will go into our vehicle systems that are affordable across all platforms. That will be the beachhead, that will be the connectivity for the industry offered solutions to interface with our vehicle system architectures. That's the purpose of that program. So that's the context. Now, the public-private partnership. We have 44 companies working on this activity. Only eight of them are funded. Does that mean my time is up? <laughs> There's something beeping up here. I think trying to stop. Only eight of them are funded, but there's 44 participating. Everybody has equal access to all the information we're developing on that program. They are all part of IPTs. They all have a voice in the outcome of that program. They're shaping the standards and the protocols, the communication between the components within that program. The goal of that program is to develop an architecture that enables every single one of those 44 suppliers to be able to compete for getting their capability onto a vehicle platform. If we went and bought just a single solution, the only people who are now in that game are the one, two, three, or four industry members that are teamed on that solution. All of the innovation from the rest of industry is done. What we're trying to do is maintain that competition for the life cycle of active protection solutions and recognize that the threat will evolve their tactics and their, their threat munitions based on the solution we field. And we need to be able to change rapidly over time to stay relevant. That will depend on a much broader innovative base from across industry. So what we're doing is trying to get that common control and architecture into the platform, but ensure that it supports all of the industry solutions out there. So that is an example of a public-private partnership where everybody has a stake, even if they're not being paid today to be a part of it. Another example is the prototyping that we're looking to do. And you're gonna hear about that today. Some of it is pre-decisional, some of it is not funded today, and they should be able to articulate those breakpoints. But what the Army recognizes is that we need a more affordable means of prototyping future vehicle systems to understand where technology can take us. I talked about the, the strategy and being able to define capability over time that the Army can take advantage of. This is our ability to take that and now build the prototype that we can put into the field and experiment with. The purpose of that prototype is not a pre-production prototype. That's industry's responsibility as part of a program or record. The purpose of this prototyping is get a functional system in the hands of soldiers, let them experiment with it, let them work with it, and then come back and refine our requirements. So it helps the Army get things right. Some people criticize of prototyping within that realm as delaying programs. Again, I have 30 years of experience where I've watched programs of records start with a lack of definition on the front end. We spend billions of dollars, years developing, and then we cancel the program because it's not what we want. 
I argue that by doing this prototyping on the front end, helping the Army understand what it wants, bringing that consensus and clarity, understanding the doctrinal implications of the new capability, will actually, over time, help the Army stay on course and help us field stuff, rather than end based on disagreements of what right looks like. We cannot do that without public-private partnership. A significant part of that will be executed within the government structure, but we are not looking to do it alone. We need the turret integrators. We need the technology developers. We need to take the best ideas from other vehicle programs, other contract offerings, and bring it together to show the Army what's possible based on the maturity of technology today. So this will be a partnership as we work together to define the vehicle, demonstrate the vehicle, and, and, um, and then refine the requirements. Whether you're a paying member of that build, design and build, or not, you'll have full access to the complete data package. You'll have full access to the analysis and the results of our experimentation. Our goal is to make sure everybody has the opportunity to be included. So then when it does transition to a program of record and that competition starts, we have now involved more people and we have greater competition. So whether or not you're a, a direct participant in development of a concept or not, you will have direct access to that data and information. We want you to be competing at the end of the day when we go to a program of record. This is to help, this prototyping is to help the Army solidify its need and hopefully stick to a program solution going forward. Okay, so this will be another form of a public-private partnership and you'll see it come out through some of our contracting mechanisms that you'll hear about shortly, but in greater detail as you work with the, the more knowledgeable people. <coughs> our technology and our focus for our investments in the uh, shaping the future is shown here. And you can see we are looking for something future vehicle systems that are much more modular and adaptable. What we have relearned, and we learn it through every conflict, is that our vehicle, the vehicle we put into conflict on day one is not the vehicle we need a year later. The threat evolves, the situation evolves, the scenario evolves, and our vehicle systems and our tactics and our doctrine has to evolve with that threat. And we've seen it in every conflict, and we relearn those lessons every, every time. So the systems we fielded, and everybody that's been in this business knows, the, field, the vehicles we took into the war in 2002, 2003, were not the same ones that came out of that war. Even the Bradley and the Abrams and the Stryker evolved significantly through that conflict. MRAPs came to fruition. And there are many, many other examples. Soft-sided Humvees became up-armored from uh, simplified kits to factory-made kits, and then eventually to an MRAP. We evolve and change. In order to do that affordably and much more quickly, we need to have vehicle systems with these kind of attributes. Modular architectures, adaptable types of protection, and again, not only maps, but also armor and other types of adaptable protection means. Open ar electronic architectures and vehicle architectures common and more efficient powertrains. It'll be critical. As we try to grow systems, we need commonality and flexibility within our powertrain. So these are attributes of our future systems that we recognize and we're going after within our strategy. And as you go out into one-on-one -on -one discussions, you can talk about that in greater detail. Autonomy-enabled systems. So we are working very aggressively with autonomy-enabled systems, not just robotic systems, that is an end state in and of itself, but autonomy-enabled systems. I will still say this community is ahead of commercial industry. Google Car and those, they get a lot of credit, they've done great stuff. They are maturing and refining things that we demonstrated almost 10 years ago. And it's great work. But we are beyond that. And we are looking for autonomy and mobility in unstructured environments. We did the structured thing, like I said, 10 years ago. 
And that's really what we're talking about. Automobiles on the highways, they're in very structured environments. You know the road signage, you know the road signs, you have curves, you have transitions from pavement to gravel to grass. These are all things machine vision can see and detect, and it helps them navigate. They also run, if you look, uh, you know, there'll be a claim uh, ran 400,000 miles on these roads. That is, all, that is a sign of maturity, but it's also a repetitive sign where they have trained their vehicle to understand that road perfectly. So now in the cloud, they can reach up and pull down data to help that vehicle make the right decision because they have that course mapped out in great detail. Those are strategies they use to reduce risk and optimize performance. We don't have that privilege if we are now going into pick the country. We have to be able to navigate and work in environments where we don't have a lot of a priori information. Or we're off road and that a priori information just isn't available. So we have to have much more rigorous, rigorous and sophisticated algorithms for that navigation. So that's where our emphasis is with our autonomy enabled capabilities. And in the soldier machine interfaces, we have to reduce the cognitive and physical burden on our soldiers. If we want to go from a four person crew to a three person crew or ultimately to a two person crew, we have to figure out how to offset some of that cognitive burden onto the vehicle system itself. So there's a close connection between soldier machine interface the size of the crew and the autonomy enabled capabilities on that vehicle. So there's a close relationship there. Okay, let me jump to the next slide. That's value stream one. That's looking to the future, that's shaping things into the future. Value stream two is the stuff we are doing in support of our programs that are fielded today. And that's what's captured here. And you can, you'll be able to look again in this pamphlet, it'll give you lines of effort. So it decomposes, the value stream decomposes into several lines of effort. And then you get into each line of effort and there's many programs within each line of effort. But these are the 300 plus engineers that sit over there in those program offices, plus the hundreds that are in TARDEC proper that, that provide general support, engineering support to those program offices. Everywhere from drawing quality, corrosion issue resolution to transitioning new powertrain capabilities or energy storage, anything like that. So there's a close connection between this value stream and what we're doing in our technology developments. And that transition of capability occurs between these two value streams. These are just some uh, current initiatives that we're working. Uh, we are working Army watercraft. That is a mission in, uh, at TACOM and within PEO, CS, and CSS and we're working closely with them in that effort. And you'll see in a, another slide or two, we have a system integration lab that we are developing for the C4 ISR integration into Army watercraft. And that is a capability that will be resident at TARDEC in support of that PM office. But you can see uh, the non-developmental, you hear about non-developmental active protection, so we are taking existing active protection capabilities we are installing them, we're characterizing the benefit they bring to the vehicle system based on the current capability, and that is closely connected to our MAPS, our Modular Active Protection Program, mm -hmm. common team members, and, and they're working very closely so that we can then transition ultimately to a MAPS compliant solution. But we're working that program more near term, and you'll hear about that a little bit throughout the day and tomorrow. And then the Advanced Combat Engine, this is a development of a new capability, new technology. We have uh, two team members working the advanced engine. It's um, AVL and MTU team, and a Cades and Cummins are teamed. And they are developing a state-of-the-art vehicle um, solution, a new engine that uh, really offers some great attributes for military purposes. And there's also an industry interest in those developments also. And that's separate. Uh, it's great to know that there's that interest and we, we definitely enable that. But we are looking for a new powertrain, the next leap ahead powertrain for military applications. And it's based on this advanced combat engine. But as we're developing it for future vehicles, we're also closely mapping opportunities to repower our current fielded system. And we are looking at those 
engineer change opportunities to those programs of record or those modernization opportunities. So we're not only looking for future vehicle systems for that, but also the transition of that new powertrain into the existing fleet. I talked to you about system integration labs just briefly on the previous slide, and you can see on the platform side, we are developing SILs, we have SILs for MRAP, for Striker, to bring software or, or other technologies into the platform and help with that engineering. We also are developing a SIL for Army Watercraft for the C4ISR. And then we have some future SILs planned for um, JLTV, and I'm missing one in my mind right now, but a couple more that are coming in. These are laboratories that allow industry at the component level to come in and demonstrate that their offering works within the C4ISR architecture of that system. And we can work out the optimization of the different solutions together into a full solution package. Then we have research SILs that allow us to work out the, the more farther reaching um, technology such as our active protection. So we have a research SIL that allows us to optimize all the components, prove that the maps, protocols, and communication compliance all works. So we have that ability to dig down into it. And again, during your breakouts, you can get into greater detail uh, with regards to that. We're also looking at the future vehicle architectures. We are projecting that vehicle architectures will be at the uh, notionally 600 volt. It'll be high voltage. PIM right now, the howitzer is the single vehicle system in the inventory that is at 600 volt, the high voltage. We anticipate for efficiency reasons, we will all be migrating in that direction over the next decade or two. So we have a SIL that allows us to, to make sure we have that architecture defined properly. Other core competencies. Now I'm transitioning into value stream three. That, all that previous chart was Valley Stream 2, the integration facilities to support programs of record. In uh, Valley Stream 3, we have the um, one aspect here that I'm gonna highlight, which is the virtual experimental capability. So as we develop vehicles or we modify vehicles, we have the ability to bring them into a gaming environment. That in gaming environment then allows us to introduce soldiers so they can fight that vehicle in a game, a gaming environment, against a vehicle that is being uh, manned by another team from a red vehicle perspective. These are physics-based gaming environments. So we can draw out the performance of the vehicle system and the operational performance of the crew. We can draw out some of our tactics and our doctrinal implications of new capability. So what we're trying to leverage is that natural gaming environment where our, our soldiers like to spend their free time, and we're trying to bring that into our combat vehicle development. And it is physics-based. You have a couple different engines, gaming engines that drive it. Some you develop lookup tables and it draws it up. Others you actually solve the physics solutions and equations in their real time. So depending on the needs of our data and our, the outcome of the experiment, we can use either gaming engine. But again, it's to be able to put, take a soldier today, put them into a vehicle that won't exist for 10, 15, 20 years, let them fight it in this virtual environment, and we can draw conclusions as to the performance of that material solution and also the doctrinal changes that that solution then brings to the table. So this environment is a key investment of ours as we continue to mature it and develop it. We've done um, probably four major experiments to date. We have significant experiments coming up. A couple slides earlier, I talked about the prototyping of future vehicle systems. That prototyping work, that public-private partnership will result in a vehicle concept that will be put into this environment. We will take it back to the brigades that helped us develop that vehicle and we will fight that system using those soldiers. And we will use that data to decide whether we are on the right track or not in the definition of our future vehicle and the requirements. So this will all be part of it. A couple different contract mechanisms. We have the ground vehicle systems OTA. Many of you are, are part of that. 
I think there's 260 plus members. This has been a very, very successful model and tool for us, contracting tool. The consortia of industry that make up the NAMC are presented with topics every year. And then they are able to propose solutions to those topics. And I'm not gonna run through the process because I'll mess it up and then my team will take twice as long describing it to you the right way. But it's uh, an annual process that goes through. I think last year we executed between 50 and 60 million dollars through this contract mechanism alone. The flexibility affords us and the greater industry involvement in shaping our investments is uh, unique to an other transaction agreement. So we've used it heavily. So this is something if you're not a member of, take a look at it and decide for yourself <coughs> whether this is an opportunity to get greater involvement into uh, bidding for some of our activities. So when you hear from our presenters about the OTA, the other transaction, the NAMC, VRA is the term we have, Vehicle and Robotics Alliance, it refers to this contracting mechanism. It's a consortia-based mechanism where consortium members bid on some of the initiatives we have in that, that uh, framework. We are also uh, working through the process and this summer we'll be announcing another OTA. So similar to NAMC in the VRA process, we are looking for greater involvement by the, the auto industry. So a lot of the members of the previous OTA, you'll see military industrial members. You'll see non-traditionals also, and it's a good, healthy mix. But I thought we, we could do a lot better job engaging with the auto industry. Many of their investments in the future vehicle systems align very well with our strategy. When you look at our 30-year strategy and you look at what the Fords, the Chryslers, the Daimlers, the Mercedes, all those companies are doing, and you go to Fre Freightliner and, and the large uh, trucking industries, they are looking at a lot of the same things we are. So we are developing another other transaction agreement. We are out competing to get consortias aligned with that greater industry, auto industry, research and development community to uh, bid on them and we will be making a decision this summer. But it will be with these, you know, the pictures are all military focused, but you can replace many of these pictures with commercial offerings that are coming through the, the uh, commercial industry and the automotive and transportation industries. But we are looking for these types of attributes. So if you're in this audience and you're part of that auto industry and not necessarily part of the military industrial complex and you have an interest in furthering your relationship with us, pay attention to this. <clears throat> okay, I'm not a good keeper of time. I got plenty of time, see? see? Yeah, don't tell, yeah. You're just motivating me. Steve, Steve lies. I am always right to the point and I never run over. Okay, so at the end of the day, it's all about the warfighter, everything we do. And I always say this kind of internal to our community, nobody in our community holds the moral high ground. Whether you're sustaining an existing vehicle, whether you're fielding a vehicle, whether you're developing a vehicle through a formal program or record, or whether you're down on the science and technology end, we all have a significant impact on the final outcome. Our partnership with industry is critical to that. If you go back to my opening here, the purpose of this is to give you access to our leadership, and that's what's gonna happen as you see him present today. Hold them accountable, challenge them. Make sure they're giving you what you need to make your, your business decision. And then during the breakouts tomorrow, come together with them, sign up for those opportunities, and, and in that forum, explain what you have to offer, but then at the end of the day, it doesn't end tomorrow. They must be responsive. We owe you something for your time being here. And if you come in and you look and there's nothing that you're interested in, I think that's still a successful outcome. Your time is the most precious asset. You're spending your time chasing a dead end 
and it takes you months or a year to realize that you're not at the right place, that is a waste of your valuable, most valuable resource. So if you're here this year and you decide next year this is not the right place to be, that is a successful outcome. We are here to give you that information, allow you to make the smart business choices. But I, I venture to guess most of the people in this room have something great to offer. And I want you to completely uh, destroy our strategy. I want you to show us something that we are blind to that will completely change the timelines that we have laid out. And allow us to deliver a capability, advanced capability to warfighter much sooner or much better than what we are planning today. So thank you very much for your participation here. I, I uh, look forward to engaging with you throughout the day. And if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to challenge us. The TARDEC staff that is here is here for you. They are responsible for making sure you get what you need. So challenge them and hold them accountable. Thank you very much for coming.